Okay, I have to apologize for these slides because I put them together very quickly, almost six years ago now, with the intention of eventually animating this presentation. This is a drawing that I have been doing on whiteboards all over companies for the last six years. But, um, and it's really illustrative and that's why we always want people to see it uh, because it helps you really understand InterSource quickly. But um, they're not the most elegant slides in the world. So I apologize. Uh, so Apache is the reference to the Apache Software Foundation, which I think is still the largest uh, open source code base collection in the world. And that um, is a very successful open source foundation that's been going for 21 years this year. And I've been a member of it for a long time now. So that's where my idea of InterSource comes from. So let's say for the sake of argument, you have a core silo and then you have some poor developer in some far flung part of the world like Brazil, who it needs to submit a pull request to that core in order to get a local feature instantiated. So in the traditional way of engineering, in at least most of the companies I've worked in, that is accomplished by a feature request. So, uh, you know, a feature is requested. There's a description, they try to be as generic as possible, make it or as specific as possible to give the engineer on the core side the best chance of putting the right things in place. And now that guy who's just submitted that um, feature request is gonna wait around until core responds. Could take a while. So, you know, they're not sitting on it because they're mean. They're sitting on it because this is unplanned work for them. They have to plan it. And so it might be a sprint or two before Brazil hears back. It could be longer than that, depending on what their current backlog looks like, right? So eventually, the, and this is called the cheese drawing, eventually the poor guy from Brazil gets asked by his boss, who we always write as a cheese, whether why he hasn't finished his work. And he explains that it's been sitting there for a while. He sent it over, but not, he's not hearing anything. So of course the cheese, his cheese, gets on the phone with the guy that you know owns the core, the cheese for the core, and they yell at each other until eventually the core guy tells his employee on the core silo that he should go do whatever it is that the Brazil guy wants him to do. And this is how most engineering happens in my experience. In um, the first project that we did at PayPal for InterSource, they knew that 65% of their time, every sprint was spent addressing these kinds of executive escalations. And it was incredibly um, inefficient for them. And so they just wanted to get rid of executive escalations and see if they couldn't get more done. That's why they originally talked to me. But nobody learns anything in this process, except that, you know, the, the biggest cheese wins, I guess, is kind of the only thing that you could really say that you learn from that. It's not good for the organization to work that way. So this is the um, hierarchy of workers within an inner source or uh, Apache project. Um, one of the interesting things about that, um, ratio, which was adequately studied by half a dozen different researchers in the early days of Apache. So there's a pretty regular progression uh, mathematically in terms of number of users versus number of contributors, number of contributors versus number of trusted committers, trusted number of trusted committers versus number of leads. And it's kind of like a factor of 10. So for every thousand users, you might have a hundred contributors you might have 10 trusted committers and maybe one or two leads. Now, let me explain what a trusted committer is because they're so key to how InterSource works. This is somebody who already works on the code base, who's a fairly senior uh, developer, and who is able to mentor other developers to get their work to be acceptable for merge. And the trusted committer's full job during a given sprint should be reviewing other people's code. They should not be writing their own code. And they certainly should not be rewriting code that someone has submitted because nobody learns anything in that. They should be guiding submitters of code instead of pull request, I mean, instead of feature requests, sending pull requests through. 
they should be received by the trusted committer with some delicacy and some um, explanation of how it fails to be mergeable and what could change. And that should come in the form of written conversation between the trusted committer and the contributor. And the reason we want that to be a written conversation is because if the trusted committer calls the contributor up and has a phone call conversation with them, then the two of them come to agreement, but still those are the only two people that are learning anything. If it's written down, then after the, the initial mentorship relationship is finished, they have the opportunity to help other people through reading that history. So here's another way to look at the code mentorship process. So the guy from Brazil who's on the left has submitted instead of a um, feature request, has submitted a pull request. That means they've read the code on the core, they've decided how to get what they need to get done done, and they've submitted a pull request as though they work on the core. The trusted committer is sitting there waiting for these things to come in and is reading them and writing back written um, instructions for how to change what was just sent through so that it will be mergeable. And they may have to iterate a few times before that first patch is all the way through and accepted and deployed. But that engineer on the Brazil side is going to learn a ton from that interaction. And so is everybody else that wants to read this conversation, which is all written later on. So hopefully that's clear. Oops, sorry, I went the wrong way. Now let's talk about the rewards of this interaction. So first of all, the guy from Brazil, his patch gets merged and therefore he gets a gold star. He got his work done, he can go on to the next thing. That's great, right? But what about the poor trusted committer? I mean, they might get a gold star for successfully mentoring somebody through to merge. And that would be great. It would be really good if they got that. But what makes them want to be there other than they've been told they have to be there? Because the contributor totally has a reason to do it because that's their job. But the trusted committer, yes, they've been given that job, but it's it's a little more abstract. They're just reading other people's code. They're just writing emails or writing advice. They're not actually coding themselves. And weren't they hired because they're good coders? Well, so we struggled with this at PayPal and we started looking for other reasons why the um, core silo commit, trusted committers could you know, be incented to contribute to other people's code bases. So first of all, these are some of the unintended consequences that might make them interested. Um, when I came into PayPal, there'd been a lot of effort to get people to modularize their large code bases. But most of the time they were unsuccessful, unfruitful, because the people working in the core, all they saw when they looked at that core code base was something they understood. So asking them to modularize was like asking them to cut off their child's arm or leg. Like they weren't really clear why they were doing it and it didn't make a lot of sense to them. But after explaining it in a trusted committer relationship with a contributor, all of a sudden that trusted committer has a lot more insight into why it needs to be refactored, where that refactoring should happen, and how much easier it's gonna make it for external parties to contribute to the code base. And that's the number one reason for doing it. So that, that's a reason why trusted committers might wanna get involved. Another one is because after that conversation happens, if it's, if it's collected into a documentation database where it is indexed and then archived, they can send both their own employees, you know, new employees, but also people from other parts of the company that want to do a similar change. All of those people can learn by reading the documentation before they bother the trusted committer or, in fact, before they bother anybody. And their first pull request will be a better one than the Brazil guy's first pull request because they'll have the benefit of all of the advice that he received. So then when somebody from another part of the company like Singapore wants to submit that pull request, the trusted committer can say, go read the very fine manual that we created for you down in the documentation 
silo and then come back to me with a pull request. So hopefully that helps you understand how that works. And then what happens if the guy from Brazil gets so good at, merge, at writing code against this code base that they start sending the Singapore guy to him for instruction instead of sending him to the trusted committer? Does that mean that that Brazil guy is now a trusted committer on the project? Well, it probably does mean that. And the more people you can get that have that level of expertise against your core silos, the better it's going to be for the company because that's a potential new employee working at, you know, new member of the core team. But it's also the beginning of cross stack knowledge in your company that you probably don't have now. Okay, we thought a lot about extrinsic rewards, things we could do to get the trusted committer to be happier. And that drawing there shows you a beer that the trusted committer is, has had delivered to them because they did a good job mentoring somebody. Um, this was a great idea we had until we realized that most of the people we wanted to uh, support didn't drink um, because they were Hindus. So we had to think of other rewards for those, for those people. Um, one of the rewards we thought about was giving them an alternative to the HR driven information about them that was put out by the company. So maybe putting together a wiki that allowed you to put a picture you liked of yourself and a little bit about what you cared about. And then you could collect badges for all the good works that you were doing in Intersource. And I think that that has partially been implemented now at PayPal. I learned about that earlier tonight. So I'm excited about that. The last thing I have to say is that at the time that I drew, drew these slides, we were really interested in developing tools that would not add additional burden to the daily work of the engineer because I witnessed their agile transformation. And what I saw was a completely new tooling chain was, was selected, but nobody was excused from using all the other tools they were already using. And so it was really resented by the engineers that an, an additional thing had to happen. So I, because I want to build this document archive, but I don't want to make it really painful for the engineers, I was thinking it would be cool if they could just say, this is a, this is a conversation that should go to the document archive just with a cl single click or checkbox. And I still think that we need to work harder on tooling to make this kind of thing easier, both for inner source and for open source, frankly. Um, and then this last one, was about thinking about the inner source commons and the kinds of things that would be there. And you've already seen what that home screen looks like. So you know that this actually came true. In fact, a lot of the things that I thought about six years ago came true. But so it's sort of, you know, gratifying for me to look at that. Um, this is another one. And this is the single most popular uh, non-code asset on public GitHub. And it has been for years. It's a small 26 page book that just talks about that first experiment that I've been talking about and how PayPal got into InnerSource. And it's designed to be read by C-levels and people who are never going to get into the weeds of it. They just want to get a you know common understanding. We gave it away at OSCON. And it, this is another thing that came true. Um, so that's InnerSource. And hopefully, this little talk has helped you understand some of the subtleties of it. There's going to be some more talks in this series of three, um, there'll be some talks by a guy who's done a really good grassroots up implementation at Nike. And then there'll be a panel of people talking about patterns and how the patterns that we build at InterSource Commons help them navigate uh, the idea of how to implement InterSource in their companies. So thank you so much for your attention and your time. And I'm really looking forward to meeting you all and um, welcome. <laughs>